Now, generally we have two groups of uh, moment connection. The one that uh, transfer the moment through the flanges, and another one is the moment end plate. Okay, the moment end plate is a, a little bit more complicated. It involves the prying action and yield line analysis. So I don't think we have time to go into that today. Anyway, so let's see. If I have the first one, I, I can just weld the flange directly to the column. And therefore, these welds will transfer the, the my axial force from the column flange into, I'm sorry, from the beam flanges into the column. Okay? And for the shear stuff, you can use the single plate without eccentricity because who cares, right? This is the moment connection. You, we already have moment at the support. You can just use the single plate without considering those who love a little and just, okay, worry about the shear and then that's that. And then we can turn moment into the axial force and design the, the, the wells to carry that axial force and then that's it. From time to time, you may end up using the full penetration because the axial force is so large. And one more thing. Remember, the axial force is in this direction and is now perpendicular to the well. So we can use 1.5 to increase the strength of the well because the force is perpendicular to the well itself. We do that. Okay. So the next is this one. Um, Instead of using, uh, instead of welding the, the two flanges to the support right away because this detail cannot be used with the cyclic loading. So when you have the cyclic loading, you rather have, you know, more ductility and, and so on because in a connection like this, if the well fails, the whole things go, right? So, it's not nice, so it, you, you would rather have something extra like this, perhaps. And we can use the extra two plates and weld the plate, the two plates with the, uh, the flanges of the beam. And when we have this, again, the shear is the same. Uh, <coughs> we can just design the plates, uh, you know, to transfer the axial force the way we, uh, we have seen before. But for this, you know, we, we have a little bit of this. The top plate is going to be you know, smaller than the beam flange, but the bottom is going to be bigger. Why? Because so that we can weld easily, you know? Let's say if that's the beam. The top plate should be, you know, narrower so that you can put the, your wells here, right? Then the bottom one should be wider so that you can weld here. It's uh, inevitable that we need to have the free weld uh, uh, for the moment connection. Okay? So that's the case. And again, when you have the plate, you just go through the, the basic limit stage, you know? The plate yielding, plate rupture, the well rupture, and so on. And then that's it. And when, when, when I look at this direction, again, you're going to have to find a big well here, you know? And sometimes you may end up using the full penetration because the force from the moment is so large. Yeah, so, oops, that's right. So that's that. And there may be something, you know, that you need to also consider, such as a block shear, if it can happen. And then the under compression, you may need to check to make sure that your plate can carry compression as well. And now it's flange plate uh, bolted. So it's pretty similar to flange plate uh, welded, 
but this time after you turn your moment into the axial uh, forces you now have so many holes to consider that means the big flow is gonna come after you and the rest is just the same just uh, check the plate as if it, no not as if just check these uh, two plates that carry the axial force okay and something extra uh, such as because you have we have so many holes on the beam we just need to make sure that we don't lose the flexural capacity of the beam too much okay and of course bolt shear rupture and here here it is this is it the reduced flexural strength you will need to go back to the I can just um, do it this way remember the flexural member that we have yesterday hang on a minute here the page about the proportion of beam and skirter with the hole reduction we check according to this to, to see if we have too many holes if you have too many holes you may have to reduce the flexural strength of the beam and this limit state does not apply when you have that one okay check the if you a net of the flange at, and it's still greater than if y a grows of the flange that is fine we don't have to uh, we don't have to worry about the reduced uh, flexural strength okay all right oops oh, okay 115 already my apologies, please hang in there. And uh, end plate is just the introduction to another kind of connection that if you really want to design this, there is this design guide available that you can acquire by one way or the other and you can just uh, read through this, very simple. And I don't recommend you uh, get it from somewhere on the internet because one of these uh, guides has been written by my uh, friend at Virginia Tech and my advisor okay and uh, yeah that's it and the column side limit state is yep as I mentioned before web yielding web crippling and something extra such as flange local bending because this is under tension okay web yielding can be un both under tension and compression because it's yielding right and then crippling that's under compression and then we have the one additional that is called flange local bending and we also have another one called local web buckling that can only occur under a pair of compression that means you have to have compression coming in from both sides for this to happen okay and that's a formula and another one that is called panel zone this is a classic thing it's the name that okay if you mention panel zone it means that you know column side limit state uh, the panel zone is the zone you know between the beams uh, let's say it's really hard to describe uh, I can use that picture here yeah. see you ha if you have oh that's a beam from one side and if you have the moment connection on the other side this is the panel zone sometimes it's under a great uh, shear force when you when you have the moment coming in the same direction right so you have the extra shear coming in from these two axial force that can shear this panel zone apart and we need to check that but if you have a case like this, you're not going to have uh, the uh, column buckling, right? The column, uh, the local web buckling. The local web buckling that I just mentioned before can only occur when you have a pair of <coughs> compression coming on both sides like this. This is when you can have the compression buckling. But the panel zone here, you need to check it under the shear force, and generally. Yep, that's a formula. And the, the see, it, that, that's a shear strength, right? And this will be reduced by an extra term if you have compression 
in the column greater than 40% of PC, PC is the squash load, is the load that you need to require to, say, theoretically destroy the column. So it's equal to F1 multiplied by the area. Okay, and then that's it. If we check all this stuff and we, we cannot get our <coughs> column to, to carry the load, we need to add the stiffness by, you, you know, let's say if the column can carry 100 tons and you have 120 tons from the moment, you need to add the stiffener to, to take care of the remaining 20 tons, which exceeds the column capacity. As it suggests here, no. What? Oh, it's uh, under LRFD. My apologies. So if if it's AAD, it's just R uh, N divided by factor of safety, right? So if you 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 ask the column to take whatever it can take, and then the rest we just add stiffness to take care of it, and that's it. I think I have uh, passed the time for like 20 minutes, and we have examples now. So maybe you can go through the example by yourself, maybe, or should we just go on for five minutes, maybe? Go on. Go. Okay. So five more minutes, okay? And you can you can take this stage. So it's just a uh, let's say uh, one example quickly. That uh, it's the estimation of the load carrying capacity of this angle. Okay, this is uh, the size of the angle, and I have four M20 bolts here. So you see, this is the classic case where you know you don't connect two legs of the angle. So of course we are going to have shear lag problem, and the L here will be that 229. Right, it's pretty long uh, connection. It's long enough. So even if we have the shear lag problem, it may not be the most important thing. Okay. So without further ado, hang on a minute. Say, so I have two angles on top and two ang angles at the bottom, right? So that now we have a single shear of bolts on this side, four here and four on the, the flip side. But here we have four bolts, but they are on double shear. So it's equivalent to having eight bolts here. For here, because we have uh, two angles, so it's four on this side and four on the other. So basically, we have eight bolts to carry the load, right? Crystal clear, right? You want picture? I think I've drawn that picture sometime before. This morning. Yesterday, I'm sure I drew it this morning. Oh, must be in the book. Ah, see, my memory is not that bad. Now. Right here. You remember that one? So we have two angles, right? Connected uh, with the the edge shape itself, and then we have the gusset. So that means this bolt have a double shear, and that one is single shear, but they ha they they there are two rows of them. So basically, we have a e equivalent number of bolts, right? So come back here. So that means we have eight bolts for each uh, side, the, the top side and the bottom side. And for one angle, we can say we have four bolts, all right? Now, for bolt shear rupture, let's say eight bolts, uh, that's eight multiplied by the nominal uh, shear and then multiplied by the area and then with the change of the unit because I was crazy enough to use the millimeters there and divided by 1,000 to get tons. So I have 95 tons per flange. So per one angle, it comes down to this. Oh, don't forget 
that you need to divide this by the factor of safety. So it's a 47.5 tons per flange and or 24 tons per angle. Right? And now we start considering the angle. The gross area of the angle itself is 17 square centimeters. And th therefore, the tensile yielding becomes just Fy multiplied by the area. Then in the end, to get the design strength, I just divide that by the factor of safety. So we have 25.5 tons. Then the tensile rupture. Now you go back there, you should know that the rupture plane contains only one bolt hole, right? So when I calculate the net area, I just use 17 and then deduct one hole. I use M20, uh, so that means uh, the area that I need to deduct becomes 20 plus 2 for the hole size and plus an extra 2 for the damage, so it becomes 24. One hole of 24 millimeters, I change that into centimeters, and the thickness of the leg of the angle is 10 millimeters. So multiply the size of the hole, deducted hole, and the thickness of the angle. So that the, that's the area I need to deduct from the gross area of the angle. And then that is the shear lag factor. 229 millimeters is the distance of the connection itself, and 25.7 is the distance of the uh, centroid of the angle. So that is my shear lag. That's in my FU, and that is my net area. So in the end, I got that as the nominal strength. Divided by factor of safety, I still have the design strength for tensile rupture greater than yielding. See? No problem. Now is the block shear. Now the block shear, my tensile area will be from the center line of the bow hole to the edge of the leg of the angles. And basically, let me go back to the picture first. Because we don't have the distance shown here, so I assume that it should be equal to the edge distance here, 38 millimeters. So that is also 38. Okay? So that becomes my uh, area under tension. Is that one? So we check the tensile rupture, that's Fu, and the net area is 38 minus half a hole, right? So that's 0.5 multiplied by 24. So I got that 10.5 tons per one centimeter of thickness. I'm too lazy to multiply with the thickness, so I'll do it later on. And then I will compare the shear rupture with the shear yielding. For rupture, it's 0.6 Fu, and the net area shall be, okay, that's 225 plus 38, right? The total length on the shear area. Then minus 3.5 holes. Let's go back to the picture. And then here, for the yielding, no hole deduction. So it's basically 225, uh, 229 plus 38. And we compare these two and we find that, oops, yielding is lower than rupture. So we use the yielding strength and add them up. And then multiply with the thickness later on. So I have the block shear uh, failure. Uh, nominal strength, I'm sorry. And then divided by a factor of safety, I have a 25.3 tons uh, capacity. And in Barrington, again, 
we check bearing each hole we have the same bearing uh, strength right so it's 2.4 fu multiplied by the bolt diameter but I leave the thickness out I can do it uh, you know at the later stage and then I will start comparing the tear out strength now the tear out has two conditions right the first one is the tear out of the one on the edge now for this the LC becomes the distance from the edge of the hole to the edge of the angle which is basically 38 minus half of the hole but for the tear out of other bolts the tear out distance will be from the edge of the hole to the edge of another hole correct so that is the spacing minus one bolt hole. So we have the two different cases for the tear out and just one general case for the bearing failure. Hmm. Here, okay. Uh, one uh, additional note uh, worth mentioning is that in calculating the tear out, you don't need to exclude the damage of the hole. So when we consider the hole here, it's basically the bow diameter plus the two millimeters to have the just just the size of the hole without taking out the damage from hole punching process. Okay. So with that, for the tear out of the hole on the edge, you have 38 minus half a hole. For the other holes inside, you have the spacing minus one hole. Right? So the tear out on the edge is only 13.1 tons. And for other inside, it's 26.2 because basically this is twice greater. So what does it mean, ladies and gentlemen? It means that for the bolt for the bolt hole on the edge, the tear out will occur before the bearing. But for other holes inside, the bearing will occur before the tear out. You know, I designed this so that we can see the case like this as a good example, you know. Now, that means the total capacity is one for tear out and then the rest is bearing. Remember, we have four bolt holes. So right here, right now, we need to have four in the end. One coming from tear out, another three coming from bearing because now tear out is greater than bearing for other holes. And multiply by the thickness in the end. But it's in millimeters divided by 10 into centimeters. Okay. Still, I have plenty. Divided by two, I still have the design strength for bearing tear out equal to 35.7 tons. And that's it. Uh, a summary for this connection is that the load carrying capacity is 23.8 tons governed by the bolt shear rupture. Okay? And we have more examples, but I think you can go through that by yourself. No, no worries. Okay? I have uh, spent like half an hour more than I should before Ajahn Sutat get upset and uh, affects my salary, I better stop the session. <laughs>